it's a little bit intimidating for me to uh, uh, give this talk uh, among such illustrious uh, architectural uh, company. Um, I, my background is not as an architect, and our project seems incredibly hum humble uh, compared with uh, Craig's or or, or Henrik's uh, airports. But I hope you'll agree that it, it has some uh, potential. Um, Oh, the bottom, sorry. Yeah, um, my background is a little bit strange. Uh, um, I, I, I spent most of my career with The Economist magazine. Uh, I was a foreign correspondent and a war correspondent. And, and what changed my life was um, was moving to Africa and becoming the Africa uh, correspondent uh, for The Economist in the early 2000s. Um, and I was one of the people who wrote this story uh, about Africa rising, and I, I think it was mentioned earlier about globalization, and obviously one of the features we will see in the next 10, 20 years is that Africa finally will join the, the global world just as uh, South Asia and East Asia did uh, 20, 30 years before. Um, I left uh, The Economist uh, about five years ago uh, because I got very, very interested in advanced technology for poorer people. Um, and I went to EPFL, which is kind of like the Caltech of Europe uh, in Switzerland, and I set up this Future Africa Lab. Um, and we thought very hard for a couple of years about what would be the next major innovation which would... Uh, hit Africa uh, and we realized it was going to be robotics, cheap cheap robots are going to be a very, very big thing along with artificial intelligence. Um, and when we started to think about cheap robots, we started to think about um, flying robots, which is drones. Um, I think Craig mentioned about uh, speed of change. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures ever. This is um, a picture of the city of Nairobi in 1904. Uh, uh, this city now has four and a half million people. And you can see right in the middle there, um, the, the, the white things are actually railway workers' tents when the British were building the railroad. And the speed of change in Africa is faster even than in China. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, this is a picture I took recently in Tanzania. This is the president of Tanzania who's driving through western Tanzania. And I, I, you know, having worked for The Economist, who quote you a lot of statistics, such as 52% of the population of Tanzania is under the age of 19. And one can intellectually comprehend that, but I think it's more useful to look at the faces here. And then, and this speaks to the last presentation, um, there, there, Norway has a lot of money. Uh, we, we have, uh, in Africa, no money whatsoever. And we know for a fact that 70 to 75% of these young people will never find a salary job in their life. It's just not going to happen for them. And there, well, there are a whole bunch of complex reasons why that's so, but the, the pressure on these rural communities and small towns is quite profound. Uh, nevertheless, the world is changing, and uh, I think the, these are the two biggest design innovations which impacted Africa since the Second World War. Uh, on the left, the Kalashnikov, um, which had a rather uh, disruptive and still very violent effect in many African countries. And on the right is actually the reason that I'm standing in front of you here in Venice. This is the Nokia 1100 phone. And some of you who are a little bit older will remember this phone and all the text messages and the ringtones and so on. Uh, when I moved to Africa in 2002, the, the mobile phone connectivity was about 4%. And even the mobile phone companies themselves were not betting on it growing much bigger. In, in, in Kenya, um, the Safaricom, the main provider, uh, they anticipated getting their uh, m uh, mobile phone subscription up to 600,000 by 2013. And in fact, by 2013, they had 22 million users. So the, the step change in, in, in the price point of certain technologies and the ability to get those technologies 
into uh, a, a very poor marketplace is one of the most uh, yeah, these are the, the main claims that, that we came up with. Uh, the first is a very, very important uh, point, and it plays off the mobile phone point. Basically, even uh, robots are going to mess up uh, many developed uh, economies, but in a poor economy which has no industrial base, cheap robotics can buy you some efficiency that your economy would not otherwise have. Um, second point, Obviously, we're not in this talk talking about moving people around. We're just talking about moving stuff around. In Africa, within 10 years, you're going to see about half of the air tonnage going by flying robot by cargo drone. So it's going to be a profound shift. Um, most small towns will have drone ports. Uh, we're already seeing, in fact, last week, I just got back from Africa, so I'll explain that the first hospitals are being connected by drone. And uh, that there will be multiple effects. One of the most obvious effects is that um, uh, more goods will be centralized in the healthcare space. Um, we're going to see the cold chain get completely disrupted. So this is our uh, group. These are some of our partners. This is the uh, concept we came up with. Uh, and at this point, we brought in uh, Norman Foster and his team, among many other partners, uh, to think through um, how uh, we might start off uh, with flying robots by uh, moving blood around. Uh, so our uh, understanding was that uh, many uh, tens of thousands of children and hundreds of thousands of mothers die of bleeding because there's no blood available to them. So we came up with this concept. Last week, um, I, I introduced an American startup called Zipline into Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is uh, the country that we're operating in, in Central Africa. And uh, last week, the president of Rwanda uh, sent off the first of these flying robots with the first payload of blood. And that, that was a big, big moment for us and for the technology. But uh, our conception, as they say, is uh, for much larger airframes. We are uh, anticipating five to seven meter wingspan airframes, uh, which will be capable of carrying uh, 40 plus kilos of payload. And uh, this is uh, a visualization of, could be Ethiopia, uh, but you get the point that uh, towns which are physically proximate by air, uh, by road, are not proximate at all. And uh, I think one of the uh, infrastructure points to bear in mind is that Africa has a $62 billion uh, public infrastructure spending deficit year on year. That just stands still. So although we're going to see new roads built, and although everybody knows that roads and railways are much more efficient than anything else, there just won't be enough roads. Uh, these are how we anticipate uh, the craft eventually looking. They, they, uh, uh, they will have vertical takeoff and landing. Um, they'll be very quiet. And critically, they'll be very, very cheap. In the large one, uh, I just came back from China, you know, the price point that the Chinese will hit on that one should be around $20,000 or less, um, which obviously is scary for a lot of aerospace companies like Airbus, who we've been working with, uh, want to try and get into that market, but the price point, I think, is too uh, demanding. So um, we put three goals. Uh, accelerate the, uh, the, uh, the advent of a, of a small, cheap uh, drone that can, that they can carry stuff. And I like to think of um, a Citroen de Chevaux uh, going to a, a nightclub and meeting up with a Star Wars fighter. And if they had a love child, that would be our cargo drone, basically. And uh, then, of course, what I'm working on mostly is the drone ports, and obviously we need a law code regulatory environment. Uh, this is one of Norman's drawings. I think this is for Hong Kong. Someone will tell me whether it's Hong Kong. Yeah. So that was one of his first drawings of that, and then, then this was his first drawing for the drone port. 
And Norman has been working with me uh, for a year and a half on this project, almost a day a week, which is a huge commitment of time for him. Um, but he believes that within a decade, the, the footprint of these drone ports will be bigger than all of the airports that he's built um, to date. Um, this is the early conception of drone port. Some of you will have seen uh, our exhibition in the Venice Biennale, uh, and, uh, and this is not to be taken at face value. What we're trying to do with the drone port is basically uh, to game a technology and an industry before it actually happens, I uh, disrupt the future before it happens, by making sure uh, that it's big enough to receive larger cargo drones and making sure it's a civic building which has some public consequence. Now, we're not talking about large cities and we're not talking about villages. We're talking about towns of 20 to 50,000 people. And we believe that most of those towns, within a decade, should have a drone port. This building, the, the fixed costs on that building uh, are about $70,000 to build it. Uh, it. It's incredibly simple, it's just rammed earth, but the engineering behind it is quite complex. Uh, I mean, the mathematics behind it is quite complex. We had a team from ETH, from MIT, and from Cambridge who are really working it out. But for the community, they just have to dig the soil out of the ground, have simple compacting machines, and, and it becomes a very labor-intensive construction, uh, and most of the cost is actually in the labor. Um, basically, the, the, the point is that, uh, uh, and I, I think, Craig, I saw that you said that there are as many future types of, uh, of airports as there are people on the planet. And I think we will see a multiplicity of forms of drone port. But the, the main point is it should be civic, should be cheap, should be accessible to local community, and it should be multi-use. So at this end, you have the drone, drone operations. So drones are landing. Um, in the middle, we have uh, digital fabrication. Um, we think that digital fabrication and 3D printing or sort of locally augmented materiality is going to be a major uh, trend in uh, Africa and other poorer economies in the next 10 years. Then there's a clinical uh, clinic element where uh, healthcare products are distributed and received. And then uh, at the end, uh, more of a post office or a courier company um, where uh, community comes, receives, and sends parcels. In the United States especially, there's a lot of money from Amazon and other companies going into last mile delivery by drone. Uh, but we don't believe at all in that uh, image for poorer countries, except, um, uh, except in the emergency healthcare space. When, as you saw those young people, when you have a very high level of youth unemployment and underemployment, you don't want to be disrupting the last mile. The last mile should be uh, guys on motorbikes, guys on bicycles, uh, people walking there. Um, so we're talking about middle mile uh, uh, distribution. Uh, this is just the conception of how it looks inside. This is the, our early, uh, early craft. Uh, at the moment, we, we, until we get the full regulatory approval, we're just shipping two or three kilo packages. Um, uh, uh, this is just the clinical element. Um, and, and, and again, as I say, one of the most profound things, uh, one of the most strange things about poverty is um, how uh, it spins off in every possible direction. And when we think about the healthcare space, for example, the mortality rate for cancer in a country like Uganda is about 98%. One of the reasons for that is that even if you had uh, a sample taken of a tumor, that sample really struggles to make it to a central hospital and back again. So we think that dr drone ports will um, will significantly help that. This is the, the first 
site for the drone port uh, that we have chosen is, is here. It's on Lake Kivu, quite close to the border with Congo. Uh, so the drones will take off, fly. The town is just down here uh, and around here. You know? Uh, yeah, so Time Magazine picks it out. Um, this uh, is my final image. Uh, somebody mentioned Victorian railway stations, and I think one of the things I learned the most uh, living in Africa and spending half my time in Africa was to reappraise my understanding of Victorians, particularly Victorian engineers. The ambition and scale of Victorian construction was quite profound. This, of course, is the Liverpool-Manchester Railway. Um, uh, and uh, you know that investment today, uh, in today's terms, would have been putting six or seven hundred million dollars on the table as a bet. Um, uh, and I think the important point about cargo drones is that they will provide, as uh, airplanes already do, uh, the, the ability to push infrastructure into the sky. But unlike airplanes, the, the price point, even if we compare it with the Cessna, we're talking about a twelfth to a twentieth of the cost per kilo of what would fly in a Cessna. So you can see that, uh, that that's a profound uh, step change in technology. Um, we have not at all thought in any way about putting humans in the cargo drone yet, and we, we're not yet entirely certain that humans want uh, cargo drones. Uh, drones are pretty annoying things uh, to, at the other extreme, quite devastating weapons of war. So well, we have to prove that they can be beautiful and uh, helpful in people's lives. Uh, but we think that the drone port is a critical element in that, and that uh, as airports are embraced by cities with improved aircraft technology, the drone port will already sit quite proximate uh, to the town and be surrounded. Um, and, and just one final quick point. Uh, no, actually, forget that. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you.